Great. So uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, our graduate open event, where today we're going to be talking about um, the MSc Physics and Engineering in Medicine by Distance Learning. Um, last week, uh, we ran a department uh, uh, event where we talked about the postgraduate programs uh, in medical physics and biomedical engineering at UCL. Um, but we've got a separate session today, really, because Distance, learn, distance learning is quite different in terms of structure of how to study. And so we generally like to give a bit more context as to exactly how that works. So if you are applying for the course, you know exactly what to expect. Um, so we've got a couple of things today um, to talk about. And, uh, and we'll hopefully have a chat with a couple of students as well so you can get some experiences before giving you a chance to ask questions to myself and to to our, our current students as well, if you like. So. Um, yeah, welcome. My name is Billy Dennis. So uh, I am the postgraduate taught programs program uh, director in the department. But uh, uh, my particular specialty in the department is with distance learning, and I'm in charge of the distance learning uh, MSc program, which is why I'm here talking about this today. So um, I'll quickly mention a couple of things about what sort of what motivates our course and why you might be interested in coming and studying with us at UCL more generally. Um, UCL's real strength, uh, it's in the university league tables and uh, is very highly regarded. It's got extremely high research quality and uh, most of our department's research comes under the banner of world leading or internationally excellent in the last research excellence framework. We've got, so you'll have an opportunity to join in that, not just learning from the modules we teach, but also joining the research groups and taking part in some of that world leading research as well. We are a relatively small department compared to some others at UCL in terms of postgraduate students. So that means that uh, we have more personal relationships with our students than some other courses do. Um, personal tuition and through supervision, you get a lot more direct contact and that means you get the benefit of that. And hopefully we get the benefit of you from that as well, because uh, we hope that you'll be key contributors to the department through the work you do with us as well. And the other thing in medical physics and biomedical engineering, um, we have a cross subject uh, department. So we cover many different areas and our particular specialty really is applying engineering and physics um, to our links with clinicians in hospitals. And uh, being in central London, we've got access to many uh, world famous hospitals. UCLH is right next door, but also Great Mormon Street Children's Hospital, uh, the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. There's a, there's a range of these that are right nearby. Many of our researchers have collaborations with these groups and you'll get to benefit from that as a student as well. So some key academic staff, this is me on the left there, some other people that you'll come across either teaching you through lecturing or potential to join them uh, in, in their research groups. You, you probably will come across these guys a little bit less, but today we're not having any of these guys apart from me. That was last week. But if you want to see our, our postgraduate team, then these are this is our team right here. So uh, nice to meet you all on that side. Ooh. So departments research, I talked a bit about this last week as well, but it, it's important to notice that you as the distance learning student um, we don't want you to be passive. You will study <laughs> probably from your own homes or from your own countries, and in which case you won't be here to be able to go and speak to academics in their in their offices directly. But we hope that you'll be joining um, some of these research groups as part of your, of your of your work on the masters. And so we've got a wide range of uh, research special, specialties in the department. Medical imaging forms a, a major part of our of our department's research of, of various methods, ultrasound, magnetic resonance imaging, biomedical optics, but also the analysis of the images that relate often to cancer therapy and things like that. So our radiation physics group is a key part of, of, uh, of our department of which this radiation, this MSc really, the distance learning one is focused on radiation physics and imaging. So this teaches you about advanced X-ray imaging and uh, We've got groups that look at detectors as well as uh, cancer therapy and in particular the proton and radiotherapy uh, which is a major specialty next door at UCLH, UCL Hospital and so um, yeah that's a major part of our group so if you want to learn more about the research being done in the department I'd recommend having a look at our website um, we've also got quite a public profile through our uh, Twitter or X uh, accounts where you can keep up to what's the latest in terms of what's being done. Uh, many of our groups 
uh, do a lot of public engagement to sort of explain uh, to a non-expert even uh, what we're up to. And so recommend you have a look at some of those when you get the opportunity. Um, roughly in the numbers of people in our department, we've got around 50 permanent academic staff, around 80 postdoctoral research staff. Um, so these are sort of slightly more junior researchers, but still with a lot of experience. And then on the student profile side, we're a department with about 200 undergraduates and roughly 100, 110 postgraduate taught students in total, including all, all the various programs, including the distance learning, and then about 180 PhD students. So again, the aim is that you to be a member of the community here in the department and, and join in that. And as I say, relatively, um, the staff to student ratio you can see is, is quite high. So you get an opportunity to spend a lot of time with our staff, we hope. I'll say a little bit about the history of the MSc program, and in particular the distance learning MSc. Um, it is a replication of the on-campus MSc that's been running here at UCL and via the University of London for many years. Um, it was first set up in 1958 by Sir Joseph Rotblatt um, at the University of London when it was based at St. Bart's. Um, so this was at the time the world's first master's degree in radiation physics applied to medical purposes. Um, that had been running for many years very successfully and then it merged into UCL in the uh, in the late 80s and 90s. Um, and then in 2011 was when we established our distance learning routes. The idea being to replicate the masters that was running on campus, partly at the time to give opportunity for, for students who might be working in hospitals, who could only study part-time to study, but also to make it available to international students who might find it uh, difficult to attend London in person as well, either due to financial difficulties of being able to travel and live in London, uh, but also due to that working part. So the, the aim of the MSc by distance learning is to provide flexibility for whatever is needed for you as a student, either because you need it in terms of time available for you to study, so you can study the MSc over multiple years, or whether you need it for location purposes. And our first graduates were in 2013. So you can see that the, the, that they weren't studying full time originally. Um, it was more part time students. And uh, today we've got a mix of both of those. Um, in 2015, the program was accredited by the UK's national body in our subject, which is the Institute of Physics and Engineering and Medicine. So we're the, currently the only distance learning course to be accredited in, in this in this area. And um, that accreditation is, is a mark of both our teaching quality and the assessments that we do, but also it marks that it can be part, can form a part of the clinical scientist registration that you require here in the UK if you want to work in a hospital as a medical physicist or, or any of other specialties under that banner. So this forms part of the training, the master's level training. Um, so you can use it, and many of our students do on distance learning to, to um, get their route to, as it's known as, clinical scientist registration, which is where you gain your own master's and then you you work in hospitals and gain the competences you need there before, uh, before uh, applying for your registration as a clinical scientist. And we've had uh, you know, decent success and excellent feedback from our students over the years and had some personal tutoring uh, award nominations in the past as well. So just to give a quick summary of what we might see for the degree, it, it is, last week we talked about the different um, specialties in the department. Uh, this particular degree, the distance learning one, is available for the radiation physics IPEM accredited stream. And we've got students that, that can study that degree over three different uh, timescales. These are terminology, this is terminology that UCL uses to describe you. And you, when you apply for the course, you'll need to pick one of these three methods. Full time means you complete the degree over one year. Um, so starting in September, you'd finish in August in 2025. If you apply by part-time, that in UCL terminology means specifically for a master's, you study over two years. So you study half the MSc in your first year and half the MSc in your second year. So you would finish then by August 2026. And then there is a third mode, which is called flexible mode, uh, which is probably most common and gives just much opportunity for you to decide uh, year by year how much you would like to study. So most students on that flexible study don't take the maximum five years to complete the MSc. Um, they'll often take fewer than that, but it gives, gives the option for you to take longer than two years to complete the MSc. So for some students, that's that's valuable. So um, 
So that's the three options when you're applying for the program. Um, the rationale for you studying is that you, you can study completely alone. <laughs> There's no need for you to work with any other students for most of the degree, or you can work in groups. Ideally, when you join the course, you'll have a cohort of, of other distance learning students that you would interact with. Many of our students, if you are studying part time, will have jobs already. So uh, uh, that's quite helpful sometimes to get a bit of extra perspective and work together, studying for exams and assessments, et cetera. Um, but as a distance learning student, you don't have to be in person. So you can, of course, study however you like. You also have an opportunity, even though you're marked as a distance learning student, some of our students like to take the opportunity to come to UCL's campus and join in some of uh, the activities that happen on campus, be it a lecture, be it a lab, be it an opportunity to, to visit the research team or the clinical teams in the hospitals. Um, this isn't compulsory at all, but uh, you know this is an option for students. Just because you're distance learning doesn't mean you're not welcome on campus. You can indeed come and, uh, and join in on campus if, if you'd like. You're, you're considered a student by any other metric um, that, that, that our on-campus students are. And so this is not just for UK students, although some of our UK students do visit campus more regularly. We've got a student um, who's from Hong Kong who's visiting uh, later this month. So it, it, it sort of depends, it's up to you. That's an opportunity for you as you study with us. So typical profiles of students that we might see who study on, on these programs. Uh, this is just really uh, some different backgrounds we have. We have students with physics degree, undergraduate degrees, we've got students with sort of engineering based undergraduate degrees, mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, and we've got computer scientists, specialists, there's, there's a wide range in there as well. So um, you could you could come from any of these kind of backgrounds. Maybe your desires for, for completing the program would be that you'd end up as a, a full-time job in a, a, as a clinical scientist, um, in which case, um, it's a good program for you. And you might consider studying over two years for the MSc to, to allow you to do that. Um, some of our students who apply are already working in hospitals and the hospitals sometimes might sponsor them by giving them one day to study per, per week. Um, a typical way for them to complete the degree is over two years using that one day uh, off work a week to study their degree. Um, then, you know, we might also have students who are let's say from the different engineering specialties or perhaps a just general physics background but are looking to specialize into our subject area having not been there before um this is this might be a, another background for you as well and if you need a bit more time to study if your available study time per week is not quite uh, enough to complete the degree over two years then you might decide to complete it over three years in which case you probably want to apply for the flexible route um, and something that's becoming more and more common in recent years is uh, for students to join and study the degree with us as a full time student. Um, so that's open to you as well. If you want to do that, then <laughs> then it really means full time. You will you won't be able to work a full time job at the same time as studying on the degree. You, you'll end up running out of time. But there's plenty of students who who follow this route. And we've actually got one of them with us today who uh, should be able to answer some of the questions about that if you'd like to as well. So these are the three main study options for you in joining the distance learning course. Um, really, again, the ethos of the program is flexible and we try to make it throughout as flexible to suit uh, individual students, to make it adaptable for your personal situation. And again, do you have the study time available? Are you only available at certain times of the week? All of that is ideally taken into account by how we teach on this course. The general cycle for a distance learning year follows this sort of conical yearly cycle where you'll study if you're multiple if you're a multiple year student you'll uh, register for modules at the start of the year and you'll need to commit to those modules um, and then you study them over the two terms before doing assessments uh, usually exams at the end of the year in may or so and then you re-enroll the following year and you complete all the modules until eventually you've completed the course um, Generally, for students who are on the five-year program, uh, they're generally it's pretty rare for students to go into their fifth year, but it's used usually as a backup in case there are certain years, for example, where maybe you're too busy, maybe there's a financial constraint that year and you don't have uh, the money to study. And so you can take a whole year out and, they, and then by having up to five years, that gives you the flexibility just in case your personal circumstances do change that much. It's, uh, it's probably more common than you'd realize. Um, 
And the other part that makes it a very flexible course is that the study is completely asynchronous, which means asynchronous, so out of time, basically, which means that you don't need to attend any live lectures at all throughout the program. I've said before, you can come and join the live lectures if you like, that's no problem. But all the materials for you to study the program are based around the recordings of the videos of the lectures plus extra materials. And the idea being that it's flexible week to week workloads. So if you have a week, if you're a student who's working in a job and you've got a very high workload week, so you don't have much time to study, then the, this flexibility allows you to easily catch up in future weeks without any problems. So quickly to go through what modules you'll be studying on this on this degree. So the there there is no option in terms of the module diet because this follows the IPEM accredited uh, route. So all the modules you choose here, you must complete to finish the degree. But what you can choose is if you're a multiple year student, which which modules you will take in which year. So however you do it, you might be a full time student, in which case you take all of these modules in the same year. But if you're a multi-year student, then we recommend you start off with the basics sort of these introductory foundation modules on ionizing radiation physics and medical imaging with ionizing radiation. So that teaches you the basics of X-ray interactions and X-ray detectors and uh, also looks at X-ray imaging in some detail, looks at uh, CT scans. It looks at nuclear medicine, so ra using radioactive sources as well as SPECT and PET scanning, as well as a bit of radiation safety in there. And then in your final year, we would expect you to complete your main master's research project, which is a substantial piece of work. But also this module, which is the group project module, the medical device enterprise scenario. So those are two research projects that you take, one individually and one as a group as part of the master's. I'll come back to those a bit later, though. And then in the middle, you might choose to take any of these modules, depending on which year you want to study. And these include imaging modules like MRI and biomedical optics and biomedical ultrasound but also more treatment focused modules like radiotherapy physics, clinical practice and uh, computing in medicine uh, as well. So how does studying work? Typically over the year, I thought I'd just go through a breakdown like month by month, roughly what, how you'll be studying and what it's like. Um, because I think a lot of people who join the course have not studied distance learning before, or maybe they've not seen how we do it. And so, the idea is to give you a quick run through here. So at the start of the academic year in September, you'll have your induction when you join the course. So ideally, you'll meet your course mates online. You'll meet your personal tutor, which is me. Um, and then after that meeting, we'll make a plan for you to decide which modules you might want to study that academic year. Um, as part of that induction, then you learn the basics of how the course is going to run for you as you study. And so we'll show you the online learning environment, which is for UCL called Moodle, which is a series of web pages or the databases where you, you'll go to, to all, all your studying throughout the course. And then we'll give you your first tutorial. So rather than me just telling you how you'll be studying each year, I'll be showing you. So I'll just give you a task to do. I'll ask you to do a little bit of research, look up in the, in the library. Uh, for some journal articles, read about that, uh, do some data analysis on some detector data and watch a video, a lecture video and answer some questions and hopefully give you a taste of how that studying is going to work throughout the rest of the year, because it's the same process in, in the induction that you'll be following up on later, showing you all the tools that you'll need to do, basically. Another thing we, we recommend that you, you do as much as possible is to have some collaboration with your fellow students on the distance learning course. And there's a couple of methods you can use for doing that using our online forums, but also we use Google Docs quite a lot as a way to anonymously interact with each other. Uh, and if we're meeting as groups, then we meet on Teams and we'll give you a taste of that as part of the induction. Um, but essentially we'll give you this, this starter course just to, to let you see how the program's gonna work over the coming year. Then uh, when term really starts is October. And generally, UCL has got three term structure. So term one from October to, De to December, term two from January to March, and term three is April until June. The third term is the space for the exam. So there's no teaching in that term. Uh, on campus, you would normally study one module in one term. So uh, you would do 10, hour, 10, 10 weeks of lectures from October to December. If you're a part time student, then we actually recommend you study in a more flexible way, which is using the recordings of the videos to study a single module instead of from uh, the start of term one to the end of term one. 
is that you you do it at half the speed, but uh, from October through to, to March. And that just means that it gives you a lot more flexibility if your work life uh, uh, get, can get on top of you and you and you don't have the time to study each week. So essentially, if you miss the weeks of lectures, it's very easy to catch up that um, if, if, if you don't have as much to do. And that's the purpose of studying at half that speed. So roughly, you'll be studying about one to two hours of videos per module per week um if you're if you're part-time students um and then you get extra resources that go with that as well it's worth saying if you're full-time then we recommend that you study by the more traditional full-time method and you'll you'll essentially do yeah one module you'll do a series of modules that complete in one term as well so as well as those videos that's not the only way we recommend you study um there'll be a series of self-study problems and opportunities for you to share your work with other students as well as getting feedback from your tutor. I think a key with distance learning is to make sure that you're being active with whatever you're doing. It can be effective for students just to watch videos or read library books, but much better is for you to do something that requires you to think about it yourself, writing notes, to do data analysis, to answer questions that get you to really engage with the materials. And so that's a big focus of the program in terms of not just being these videos and textbooks to read through, but give you something more active for you to, to really engage with your learning. And so on top of those kind of extra exercises and quizzes you'll see, you'll get opportunity to uh, look at online textbooks and other resources as well. Um, to help you keep sort of online for, for your studies uh, throughout the program, we would expect that you, you aim to complete certain lectures by certain dates, which is shown in this timetable on the right here. So you can see by each module is broken up by topics, and you study each topic by each week. And then hopefully you'll you'll be at a point where you've completed enough of your studies that you'll be able to submit one of the tutorial submissions, which happen at regular points throughout the year. Those tutorials work in a way that allow you to get some feedback and hopefully they're checkpoints that keep you on target to complete the modules by the time of the exams. So here is some examples of like online sharing forums. So the little exercises you might do, we encourage students to upload their work and compare with each other to give you the same kind of experience as if you're sitting next to a student in the lecture theater and you just turn to look at their work and said, oh, what did you do on that problem? It's an aim to replicate that same process. And uh, yeah, the online Google forums we use quite a lot as another way to ask questions and get help from people on the course. So tutorials, I've mentioned this already. Um, there are regular tutorial meetings you'll have uh, with me, the tutor throughout the year. Um, the structure of these tutorials are, are that you'll will be asked to complete an exercise. You'll be asked to submit that exercise in Moodle, the answers that you have. I'll mark it and then give it back to you and give you feedback. And then the following week we meet and we have a conversation about how that went. We go through any problems you have. So you make sure that you're getting good feedback. Do you understand these topics? Uh, and you can ask questions and if you need any extra help with anything, basically. So again, we're trying to make it as active as possible for you as you study and to make sure that you're properly supported as you study. Now, these tutorial exercises can cover a range of different topics. Um, some of them are problem solving, more mathematical type problems. Some of them will be literature reviews, looking through the academic research journals to find information that will be useful to know either for your projects or for your modules. Some of them will be data analysis of experimental data. Some of them will be using research software. Programming tools are pretty common and very useful as well, so you'll see a bit of that. And also at the end of the day, we want all our students to do really well in the course and get high exam marks. So some of them are exam question practice as well. So all of these exercises you get feedback on and you get a chance to talk about and uh, ask questions about. So that's how our tutorial systems work throughout the year. So examples that you might see, this is one from computing and medicine, filtering in the frequency domain, taking some images and doing some analysis on them here. So, and then, uh, so we start with a brain image and then we follow it up by looking at some this is some cell images from an electron microscope looking at nerve cells in the brain and doing some image analysis on that as well. So that's a fairly typical thing you'll see. So most, then we get to assessments, um, which are generally in May or June, then in term three, as I mentioned. So the exams will be then certainly. Um, the structure of the program is that you're studying the exact same degree as the on-campus version. So you get the same assessments that they do as well. So you're sitting the same exams at the same time as we do here on campus. And um, for this coming year, all of our modules will actually be sat online um, using the platform assessment UCL. 
Um, that's pretty typical here on campus as well. Most modules in our department are also run by online exams now as well. So they are technically open book, uh, but they're timed online exams where you need to download the paper, write your answers out, and then re-upload them by the end of the exam period. Most modules also have a coursework, meaning uh, an extra exercise that counts towards the final module mark, and they're usually integrated throughout the year. Um, up to about 20% is fairly typical of a module, and they're usually problem solving or some data analysis and those kind of tasks. And they're integrated into the tutorial slots. So those regular points that we, we check up on you throughout the year, um, you get an extra exercise to complete. So rather than overloading you with lots of work to do, the courseworks are fed into that system. So you complete those courseworks within that tutorial time frame as well. So here's an example of an, uh, of an exam paper from a couple of years ago. So onto research projects. So this is obviously a major part of any master's degree. It's actually worth one third of the total degree mark for any master's degree. So 60 credits out of your maximum 180 credits you'll take. Um, you'll study it in your final year, no matter what that is. So if you're full time, then your first year is your final year. So you study it then. And if you're part time, then we recommend that you study it in your final year again so that you can use the things you've learned in the modules you studied as part of your research project. Um, there's a couple of major ways that students do that as a distance learning student. The first is that we can develop you a local project uh, with academic support based here at UCL. So if you've got an environment, perhaps if you work in a hospital or if you work in an industry with access to relevant you know, <laughs> equipment, medical engineering related equipment, then you can use it and develop a project there and we'll help you do that. And um, often that's a very good way of doing it, particularly for students who are already working in hospitals. It's an opportunity for really for you to interact with your colleagues there and sort of further yourself at work as well as with us. Um, if you do that, then we assign you a supervisor here in the department with, a, with the same expertise who'll be able to support and uh, your project and, and contribute to it as well. The second alternative is that you sign up to the standard list of master's project proposals we have here in department. At the start of the year, academics in the department uh, propose projects for master students and the master students just apply for them. They look down the list of the ones they like and if they like the sound of it, then they can join it as long as they've got the skills. So you'll see again, from all the research groups in the department, you get an opportunity to join any of those in theory. Um, as the distance learning students, there will be a couple that you may not be able to do if it requires you to collect the data yourself in person. Um, but most of the projects will allow you to, to join them through the data analysis. The data analysis is often the, the core of most master's projects. So, um, so actually you're available, you should be able to join a lot of these. Um, so that research project has regular assessments throughout the year to help you progress. There's sort of checkpoints again, you start off with an outline, then you have a progress report. There'll be a point later in the year where you have uh, you must submit a research poster and join in the research poster conference that we have here on campus um, and then at the end of the year you submit your thesis which is your final uh, dissertation on, on the research you've done and ideally what we'd hope from you is that any master's project is that that you do a piece of research of quality high enough that we can publish it in a research journal and then maybe if you're interested you could uh, stay for a phd afterwards it's one of the more common ways that students get phds in our department is to do a master's project and impress their supervisor there and therefore the supervisor looks for funding to, to recruit you as a PhD student going forward. So that's fairly, that's an opportunity for you as if you study with us. Um, and then the other thing you have for your research projects in your final year is the group projects, the medical device enterprise. So this is a group project where you will work with students on campus in a group to solve a medical problem. So at the start of the year, we give the group each group a, a medical problem to solve. And we say, can you please find a way to solve this problem by making a brand new medical device? Uh, the idea being you might, the device has to be completely new. So you can't be replicating someone else's work. And then you have to make a business plan of how to take it to market. So the groups here we got on campus, I mentioned last week at the general postgraduate uh, session, that we've got students with all kinds of different backgrounds. And the idea is to make use of those to you know, combine all those different skills from those backgrounds in a way that's, that's, that's interesting and helpful, basically. So you've got computer scientists in your group. You'll, have, you'll certainly have physicists and various types of engineers. They'll have different skills to contribute to, to the group output. 
So here's an example of some devices that, that have been made in previous years. Uh, a couple of years ago, COVID was a, was a very big deal, obviously. And so there were, the task that year was to make some support devices to help someone suffering from COVID. This is an electrical stimulator you can see in the bottom here that's, that was made by one group to, to uh, help uh, strengthen someone's cough muscles if they needed to cough badly to get mucus out of their lungs. And so literally an electrical shock provided to the abdomen which could contract and support you in a cough to give you the strength because a lot of COVID patients ended up quite weak. And this was a supportive way to contribute to that as well. So another year, one of the one of the tasks was to create technology for the visually or hearing impaired people. And so we've got a little mouse braille reader here that a group made, which looks like a mouse. And you run that mouse over the top of any text. It had an automatic imaging device in there that could read that text and then convert it to these pins you'll see on the top of the mouse that would raise up and down and give you the braille uh, version for people who are blind. So really interesting devices. It's often the highlight of many students' uh, study on the masters, a chance for you to be creative and come up with something yourself as well as work with other students. And so every group has a distance learning student on it. So at least one every year. And so uh, we're very used to integrating our online students with our campus students in this module. Um, it's something that I have to do quite a lot myself as well. You know, every academic has collaborators internationally that, that we sometimes have to work around and so it's similar for you as students so we expect our students to deal with our international uh, online distance learning students at the same time um if you'd like to know a little bit more about the department generally and some of the research that's being done there's all kinds of things you can look up later i'll put up the link for our um for our department's twitter which i think is a good thing to follow if you want to see the latest research being done in the department but oh, there's also this which is Rankin's radio a podcast that I was involved with that involves conversations with academics about the, their research profiles, basically. And uh, there's a few of them you'll see covering some of the broad topics that, that are researched in our department. The aim of it is to be very accessible. So you don't need to be an expert in MRI to understand the MRI episode. It's all explained in there. So I'd highly recommend having a look on that. It's on SoundCloud. Type it in Röntgen's radio. It's named after the, the man who discovered the x-rays for the first time. So that's why Röntgen. So as a distance learning student, um, you've also got some other opportunities to, to join the department, really. We you say we want you to be part of the community as much as possible, and, and we will treat you that way. So if you want to speak to other lecturers, it doesn't matter that you can't knock on their doors, email and speak to them and ask them to, ask to speak to them on Teams. It's really regular, you know, especially since the COVID pandemic. Our groups are very happy talking on Teams and uh, and speaking to students, answering questions, or just you know giving career advice and all that kind of thing as well. You'll also see in department we've got monthly research seminars that we encourage students to join. They're generally run uh, either hybrid or on Teams, so you can always join those as well, even if you're a distance learning student. And to make use of the UCL careers team, who are really really good at helping find jobs, helping you improve your resumes and uh, and think about your careers more generally. Um, so yeah, th th it really is a hope that you as a distance learning student don't get isolated in studying yourself, but you come and join in the communities that we've got either with distance learning students or with our campus students as well. And like you've got access to the, you know, this world leading university. So we really recommend that you make, make use of that and come and, and come and see us. Careers after graduation, we kind of talked a bit about this already, but there are there are a wide range of different careers you can use on it. At the end of the day, we are an analytical engineering physics degree, so you can use those analytical skills in a wide range of uh, subject areas. I would say that most students are looking to specialise with us um, in order to have a career, particularly in our subject area, either as a clinical scientist in a hospital or as a, you know, a med tech companies are pretty common as well. But again, make use of those careers teams afterwards. I would strongly recommend that. Minimum requirements for the course. We would hope that you would have an undergraduate degree or an overseas equivalent of a 2-1 uh, that's in a physics, engineering or closely related subject. Um, we do have students with degrees that are slightly different to that. Occasionally we'll have students with backgrounds in radiography or in biology, sometimes we see, or chemistry, that's all okay as well. What we're really looking for is that you are able to complete the course as much as anything else. So you'll need to have a certain level of mathematical 
ability. You don't need a full maths degree for that. You don't need a full physics degree necessarily for all that maths, but you do need to be familiar with the problem solving style that comes with that. Sometimes we will accept students with a 2-2 onto the programme as well, and that sort of depends on what else you can offer as part of your CV. Ideally, some extra experience. So if you've been working in, uh, in, in the subjects and got some experience specifically, then that's always a positive. We would look at your degree and see whether things like your research projects were strong. Uh, and if you do that, then we do sometimes accept students with two twos as well. So if you've got any questions about that, please do ask us. So you can email our admissions tutor or myself at any time for that as well. And then finance for the program here, you can see the course fees for the distance learning program, which match the campus MSc program fees. The only difference here is actually for overseas students, it's slightly cheaper for our fees for distance learning. So there's a slight discount for studying by distance learning if you're an overseas student there. Part, you don't need a visa to study with us because you'll be presumably studying from your home uh, countries. So it's slightly cheaper for that, that could be helpful. And there's a range of different postgraduate loans and scholarships that you can apply for. Um, just be aware that the deadlines for some of these scholarships, if you do apply for them, are, it, are quite soon. So you might want to look at that quickly if you're thinking of applying for specific scholarships. Okay, great. I think we're about finished. I might come back to those questions a bit later, but um, I'll just put up here on the screen uh, some links that you might find interesting if you want to follow us over the next coming months, either uh, um, on Twitter or on Instagram, pretty active, or if you want to look at our podcast, as I say, or look up UCL Engineering as well. So there's opportunities for you there. But next, um, I'm going to invite, we've got some uh, current students studying on the course with us uh, this year. And so uh, I thought we'd just have a quick conversation with some of those guys and see if, uh, see. Uh, first of all, I'll interview them so you can uh, know a bit about them. And if you've got questions, then you can ask them as well. So uh, I'd like to welcome Connor and Tim, who are both current students with us. Um, uh, Connor and Tim, are you there? Hi. I have the wrong background on. Hello. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, don't oh, worry. Yeah, so that, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we've got two students here, Connor, who is a full-time student studying on the distance learning course this year, and Tim, who's a part-time student. So a couple of different perspectives here. Um, Connor, could I start with you, if it's OK? Um, sure. Perhaps, could you tell me a bit about yourself and your background? How did you come to study on the programme with us? Like, why did you study? Why, why have you come to study at UCL this way? Um, well, um I was hoping to get into a more medicine related uh, field. So I'd, I'd studied my undergrad as a, as a physics student uh, with Open University. I'd done distance learning before. Uh, so it was something that um, I thought I might like to try again, um, but with, with a sort of um, view to eventually uh, getting some sort of clinical adjacent job um, and I found this course um, it great. seemed like what I was looking for and it was yeah. so <laughs> okay great yeah excellent so you're <laughs> given your full time you've started your projects already this year could you say could you tell us what your project is and how that's going so far? Um, my project is a piece of software that is supposed to be able to remotely gather information on how field of view affects a laparoscopic surgery simulation. Um, so we're hoping to gather data on the effects of fields of view, field of view in particular, and mosaicing, um, mm -hmm. because apparently, according to my supervisor, this is quite a poorly substantiated uh, limiting factor of keyhole surgery that everybody sort of brings it up as one of the limitations, but but nobody really has quantified to what degree it's a limitation. So, Right, yeah. And that project, would, was that on the project list of proposals from the department, that one? It was, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So that's, yeah, that's one of the ways, as I said, you can you can just join one of the proposals projects and join that way, so it's quite helpful. Um, Tim, I would like to move on to you, if that's okay. Um, could you, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, could you say a bit about yourself, your current working situation, and like why are you studying with us? 
Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So currently I'm working um, as, I suppose, a trainee medical physicist for a, a private radiation protection and medical physics provider. So we work with the, work with the NHS, uh, work with private healthcare companies and some industrial clients as well, because there's actually quite a lot of industrial uses of x-rays that often people don't, um, don't realise happen, whether that's in research or um, testing of products and that sort of thing. Um, so to further my career, I was offered the chance to, to undertake this master's. Uh, and as I'm based just outside Birmingham, it was perfect for to be able to do it remotely. Um, so I'm lucky enough that the, the company offered me one day a week. So I'm doing it part time over two years. Um, so I study alongside work. Um, I get one day a week, which I get all my lectures done sort of in that time. And then um, most of the course, over, but occasionally a bit of evening work needed just when, when times are busy. Um, before that, my, I'd actually my undergrad in chemistry um, a little while ago now, it seems. So um, the online stuff was totally new to me. I, I'd never studied online, really. It was all in person I was used to, but it's very easy to pick up and sort of the resources that are available. Um, it's fine. And the support I find is really good remote. So, yeah, no problems with that. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. <laughs> That's a really nice comments as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, Connor, I didn't really ask you this yet, but like, how are you finding studying generally? You've had some experience at distance learning before, but is have you how are you keeping up? Is it how are you finding studying that way? Um, yeah, it's it's working well for me. Uh, it's you know it's it's a lot of work as you'd expect from a full time master's course, but um, yeah, that largely uh, the way the course is structured, you can fit it around whatever's going on in your life. Uh, provided you can make the time to study afterwards um do you consider yourself quite an organized person generally because i think that's some of the challenge that often comes to distance learning you need to organize your own time like more so than perhaps an on-campus student does yeah i would say um i would say um i wasn't before i started doing distance learning in my undergrad but yeah um you have to become quite organized um, when there's nobody actually physically telling you to do anything. Um, there is a, a need to organize yourself quite strictly. <laughs> yeah, I think I, 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 my experience of seeing students over the years study this way, I think it's another benefit actually of studying by distance learning um, that if you if you've come out the other side of it, you know, and completed the program, you've had to be more organized than a lot of other students. And that means that actually you take skills into your future careers that many of our <laughs> campus students don't necessarily have at this point, because, you know, you're much more self-responsible uh, and you can talk about that in interviews and things like that as well. So uh, it, we often end up, I may be biased because, you know, I've been running this program, but I often think our distance learning students are amongst <laughs> our best students that we have basically. And maybe it's a part of that, and maybe it's because the quality, like of Tim and Connor, that joined the course in the first place. But um, we've seen it as well. So a lot of our students, in the, we have a department prize, for example, for the best MSc student and the best MSc project. Last year's winner of the best project was a distance learning student, um, and we've had winners of the main MSc prize as well by distance learning. So yeah, it's often it's often a successful route. Okay, great. Um, uh, we've had some questions in the chat, so I'll just uh, I'll, I'll go through those quickly. Um, I've got a question from someone here saying, I'm currently working full time as an embedded software engineer in a medical company producing X-ray systems. Would this be suitable for me? Um, yeah, it, you, I mean, obviously you would need to decide on it specifically what you're hoping to get out of the degree at the end of the day. But particularly I've seen students with similar backgrounds to yourself. You can sort of see that Tim's current position is not necessarily like the, we've got students that work in hospitals for example doing radiotherapy planning which is very typical um these uh sort of more industry-based students are, are common as well It'd certainly be suitable if you'd be interested and the background uh in in software engineering will be certainly very helpful as well i'm not quite sure what the rest of your background is but yeah if you've got further questions then do apply great and then uh answering the next question if you study on the flexible routes and would like to attend an in-person lab or lecture, how much notice do you have to give to attend? Okay, good question. So um, particularly because we've got Tim here, because <laughs> he's actually a student, obviously you know, he said he lives in Birmingham, so he's been able to potentially come to some sessions. So we have labs that are run on campus. 
And sometimes students are able to come and join those labs in person. And sometimes uh, we can create extra sessions for students to do that lab separately. Tim, would you like, could you tell us about the labs that you, did you come and do one already and you've got another one to do later this month? Is that uh, I've done, I've done a lecture already. I came down for a lecture and then oh, you didn't one come of the two meetings as well. I thought, yeah, because there's there's a lab on ultrasound imaging, which I, I don't think you're doing that module this year, actually. No, I've got that next year, yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's another opportunity. But um, but Tim's actually coming later this month to do the X-ray detectors lab that, that did run in term one on campus, but there's two distance learning students that are coming to do that in a separate session later this month. So in terms of you can, if you can attend the live sessions with the campus students, then great. Sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. And so uh, it's often possible for you to come and do those labs anyway. Um, so how much notice do you have to give to attend? Well, let us know as soon as possible and we'll arrange something basically. I think Tim, we, we talked about this uh, right at the start of the year that this might be a good opportunity. And last yeah. year we we're trying to fit it into the schedule so that you studied enough of the module and that obviously you're, that you're available to come. Um, as well so yeah the, it's definitely an option there's no like list of how much time you need to give um if you can attend the live sessions with the campus students then just let us know and otherwise ask us we're really keen to accommodate our students that way okay next question it says uh, you just said that we need some math background to study this masters exactly which modules are we expected to take in our undergrad so well, I, I can't speak directly because different universities have different courses there. It's, it's not, some, yeah, in terms of modules, we expect some, definitely enough fundamental mathematics. I would say most of the maths on this, this degree is not to such a level that, that you would be hindered from studying. Um, you could come with some pretty low level skills. You need to know, you know, the, the basic trigonometry, the basic exponentials, the basic work with calculus, but not much more than, say, a first year physics student would normally do on their undergraduate degree. Um, but enough to be able to solve those problems and be able to handle a bit of calculus. But again, most of the stuff that's taught that goes to a higher level is taught in the modules as well. So if you need to, for example, one of the modules talks about using matrices to solve some mathematical problems. If you've never done that before, that's actually fine because it's taught in the module as well. So that's completely, uh, it sort of depends on your background. If you've got questions about it, whether your background is enough, then send us an email to the admissions uh, email address and we can, we, can, we can give you an answer basically on that. But generally we're looking to see whether you're capable. It's not necessarily about, um, you know, it's not necessarily about saying you haven't got enough here. We want to check whether you think you've got enough um, to study because we don't want a student joining a course when they can't do it basically. So that's the aim there. Okay, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Maybe Tim or Connor, if you do, then type them in the chat. If not, that's absolutely fine as well. Yeah, thanks, Naomi. I think she, Naomi's just put the uh, link to the, the email address for asking questions if you want it as well. Okay, I'm not sure if there necessarily is. So I'll... I think I'll bring this session to a close overall then. Um, the engineering faculty has asked us if, uh, if if you've attended this session and would like to give some feedback about the experience, then then you can uh, you know, use this QR code to go to a form and give us some feedback as well. So this is here if, you, if you'd like to do that. But uh, otherwise, if there's no further questions, then, uh, then thank you everyone for, for joining and thanks to Tom, Connor and Tim for joining as well and answering the questions. And um, hopefully I'll hear from you uh, before you come to study with us uh, in September. Thanks everyone. Okay, see you later.